Well, as uh, most of you know, here at Oak Hill, we have a passion for diving deeply into an expository uh, study of the scriptures. And that means just taking a book of the Bible and going through it from beginning to end and exegeting its meaning and pulling that up and then applying it to our individual lives and to our lives uh, as a church family. We think that's just the best way to get a solid spiritual meal on a Sunday morning. And uh, in recent years, as many of you have been here this whole time, we've, we've walked through the book of Romans over years, and now we're walking through the gospel of John over years. Uh, it's been wonderful, but having said that, there are times when it is appropriate and helpful for the church to pause, to step back, and to look at the arc of theological history from above, from 40,000 feet above, to see the big picture, right? We sometimes talk about doing biblical theology where we're, we're, we're looking at the whole biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation and seeing the Bible not as a bunch of uh, disconnected books you know, that lay out a bunch of sort of disconnected doctrinal positions, but seeing Scripture as a unified whole that tells God's story from beginning to end. It's one of the ways that we can see uh, the character of God more clearly. It's one of the ways you can see what is most important to Him and to see how He is working out His plan for us. And so that is one of our goals here uh, in Advent 2022. And you can see, by the way, we've got our second candle lit this morning. We remember to do that. That's, that's good. In all the craziness, we remember to do that. That's good. And you can see on the screen the title of our series, Your King is Coming. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you missed last Sunday, let me try to quickly bring you up to speed. Last week, we talked about the ancient roots of Advent, the celebration of Advent, how it goes back to the fourth century. And so we have this long history, the life of the church. For more than 1,600 years, we join with believers in counting down the weeks of Advent towards uh, the Christmas celebration. Then we talked about all, how all the great hymns and carols, how they have always been intertwined with the celebration of Advent. Songs that had a, a dual focus, some that focused on the, the humble Christmas story, you know, Christ in the manger, and then others that talked about the day of the Lord. And the great return of Christ as conquering king. So both of those pieces are important when it comes to Advent. And last Sunday we looked at this haunting melody of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And this morning we're going to break down Hark the Herald Angels Sing. As Gabe said, there's some really great theology that you should know in those songs. Let me also point you to the grammar of the title that you see up there. Your king is coming is written in the present tense. And that is intentional because... As we talked about last Sunday, Advent has an already not yet foundation to it, right? Meaning there is a past and present reality to the fact that our King has come, but there is also a fullness of that reality which still remains to be completed, right? At some unknown point in the future when Christ returns in power. So it's already true our King is coming, but there's more to come, right? Amen? So we're going to be looking at four aspects of Advent in this series last Sunday, We'll get it on the screen. We looked at your king is revealing himself to the world, and this morning your king is redeeming a people for himself. And that first one is foundational. That's why we started it with it as number one. God has to reveal himself to mankind if we're ever going to know him in any meaningful way. Now, uh, as we know from Scripture, mankind can look around. They can see God in creation. Uh, they can see the designer of nature. We can sense uh, his moral law in our conscience, but we can't personally know God unless he chooses to reveal himself to us. And that's what we studied last Sunday. We looked at what we call God's special revelation. First to Israel through the prophets, remember, in many portions and in many ways. And then finally, and most decisively, in Jesus Christ, who took on flesh and revealed in his person, in his person, the character of God, the identity of God, and the glory of God. And our, our key verse was Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, which is on the screen now. It simply reads, In these last days, meaning the church age that we're living in right now, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his Son. Right? He is the final revelation we should expect, the greatest revelation, God himself in the flesh. It goes on, He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature, upholding all things by the word of his power. So having revealed, revealed himself to the world now, this morning we're moving on to this next step, which is God not only revealed himself and is revealing himself, but he is redeeming a people for himself. Now, we often use theological words in the church, and we don't stop to define them, so it's important. We know this word redeem, but what does it actually mean? 
When we read over, do we look just read right past it in Scripture? Do we stop to say, well, what does that word mean? Here's a really simple definition. It's the act of gaining or regaining possession of something in exchange for a payment or a clearing of a debt. Look at that carefully. The act of gaining or regaining possession of something in exchange for a payment or clearing a debt. It's a very important theological word. You will find this word more than 100 times in Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. It's also a concept that parallels a very important New Testament word, a verb, uh, to ransom, which we see 27 times in Scripture, the most important being a very famous verse, Matthew 20, 28, where Jesus himself says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then Paul reiterates that truth when he's writing to uh, his first letter to Timothy, saying there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So all these, this idea of redemption, this idea of ransoming, all fit together into this one concept. And this portrait that we have in Scripture of redemption is very, very beautiful. Think about this. Human beings find themselves bound in captivity to sin. We're all born into it. We're captive to sin, and therefore we're separate from our creator. And yet we learn, as we look at biblical theology, we learn that this great God, this God of of majesty and glory, the very creator of the universe, has had from the beginning a plan to regain possession of a particular people. He's got a plan. And that plan is to give himself as a ransom for sin. Think about that. I mean, all kinds of options that God had, right, as the creator and the almighty, but he says, no, I will handle this myself. I myself will ransom their sin. So the creator himself is going to take on human nature in order to redeem us. He is going to make a payment sufficient for all of our sin, and he will see to it himself that this debt that we owe for sin is going to be completely canceled out. It really is an amazing story. Now, that's already been completed, right? On the cross, Jesus said it's finished. If you're found in Christ this morning, it's already been accomplished, and yet it's not complete. And we have much more to look forward to. Now, when we normally talk about redemption, our minds usually go straight to Jesus, right? But this morning, I want to take a much broader look at this biblical theology when it comes to redemption. Because the sin of mankind was ransomed on a Roman cross right around the year 33, it's natural to ask the question, well, what about people who lived before that? What about people who lived before 33? What was the source and the means of salvation for the Old Testament saints? And especially, we look back to these really, really ancient men and women who lived before Genesis 12. The really ancient folks, Genesis you know, 1 to Genesis uh, 11, that's really, really old. Um, and this gives me a chance, of course, to give you a timeline this morning. So I'm going to take advantage of that. We're going to fill this in as we go. These are just roundabout numbers and dates. But I want you to see that right now we are between 4 BC and the second advent, right? This is the last days that the author of Hebrews gives us, what we call the church age. So if you want to look back to Adam and Eve somewhere around 4,000 BC, that's a, that's a good date to, to consider. So the fall in the garden is recorded in Genesis 3. And within just eight verses, eight verses, we first hear about God's promise of redemption for his earliest image bearers. Now, I know we recently studied this, so I'm not going to take a lot of time going through it. But remember, Genesis 3.15, right? God promises that someday he is going to send a head crusher. You guys remember we did this little series on the head crusher? And he will destroy the work of the serpent that took place at the fall in the garden. And this individual, this head crusher, is widely understood to be a coming savior. Later, he'll be referred to as God's servant and the Messiah. He will save his people from their sins, and he will redeem them as a people for God's glory. Let me get this right out on the table before we go any further. I know we're only in Genesis 3, but let me get this out. At no time in biblical history, no time, not even in the garden in Genesis 3, at no time in human history has any man or woman been saved by their own good works. Never been saved by their self-effort. Never been saved by keeping a law. The text says that it's God who is going to take the initiative, even back then in Genesis 3, to fix this inescapable problem that Adam and Eve had created for themselves and for their descendants. He is going to be the one, it says in the text, to put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And it's not going to be Adam that's going to fix the problem. 
the, fixing the problem will fall to this unique seed of the woman who will come at some point and crush the head of the serpent. So God will do that work. So listen, there's no system of human works capable of making you righteous in God's sight. Let me say it again. There is no system of human works capable of making you righteous in God's sight. You and I can never reach God's standard of holiness on our own. So if any human being, anybody talked about in the Bible, is found to be acceptable in God's sight, it's for one reason only, because God caused that to happen. Because God made it happen. Make sure we know that as we go any further. Now, as we move past the fall and we start to look at God's plan for redemption, in chapters 4 to 11 of Genesis, we begin to see certain markers, certain markers that show that God is at work establishing a line of redemption. He is calling a people to himself. Genesis 4, for example, read a couple of interesting statements. This is after the incident between Cain and Abel. Eve gives birth to a third son whose name is what? Seth. Right. In Hebrew, Seth means appointed or even substituted. And with that name in mind, Eve declares this. Yes, Eve says this. God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel. And that's practically true, but there's something deeper being, being communicated here. Eve appears to understand and believe that it's this son, Seth, through whom God will fulfill his promise, who, through whom will send this head crusher and this redeemer. And we see the beginning of that start to manifest as early as Genesis 4.26. The text says that Seth had a son named Enosh. Okay? And at that time, when this son of Seth comes around, I'll put this on the screen, it says, mankind began to call on the name of the Lord. So God is already at work by Genesis 4.26. Now, that's an odd statement we see on the screen there. Most commentators believe that that statement is a reference to the beginning of public worship of Yahweh. When men began to publicly worship, it also likely means that at the same time, the, the previous practice that Adam and Eve had enjoyed of walking with God as with another person, that that privilege had come to an end. And if that's the case, as mankind begins to call in the name of the Lord, it's going to require them to have greater faith because they're not walking with God face to faith, but they have more faith in a deeper way because being in God's immediate presence was no longer possible. So what we see in Genesis 4.26 is that faith is increasing and God's redemptive plan is starting to unfold. Now, let's pause for a second and let's talk briefly about our Advent hymn for this morning because there's some really interesting lyrics that connect with what we just talked about. Hark the Herald Angels Sing was originally written and published in 1739 and its original title was really catchy. It was called Hymn for Christmas Day. I mean... Creative people can't title anything better than that. Anyway, the original lyrics. Now, last week we looked at a song. Nobody knows who wrote the original. This one we know. Very famous Charles Wesley is the author of this song. Brother of John Wesley, together as a duo, they wrote many of the church's most beloved worship songs. So Charles Wesley wrote this song. One of the funny stories surrounding this song is how the first line that we all know so well was not, it was different back in the day. The original first line read this. You'll like this. Hark how all the welkin rings. Now, apparently, I had to look it up. Apparently, welkin was a very old English term for the sky or the heavens. And that's where Wesley sort of pictured the angels coming out of this celestial place up in the heavens. So about 15 years later, of all people, the great preacher George Whitfield got a hold of this song, liked the lyrics, but said, that line's got to go. <laughs> and he changed it, and it's, he changed it to the, to the line that we sing today. Now, most of us are, are, are fairly familiar with the three stanzas that Gabe led us in this morning, but there's actually six in total. And the three on the back side are really dense in theology. It's probably why we don't sing it much, because it's not quite as, as rhymey and not quite as fun, but it's really full of theology. So I'm going to walk you through some of it. So here's stanza number four. Oops, stanza number four. Listen to it. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. So that's a reference right back to what we just talked about in Genesis 3.15. Wesley had that same thing in mind as he was looking forward to Christmas. Next stanza. Now display thy saving power. Ruined nature, now restore. Restore. 
Now in mystic union join thine to ours and ours to thine. See that phrase, ruin nature. That's obviously a reference to the fall, right? To original sin. And like the song says here, our cry, the cry of God's redeemed is for our nature to be restored back to its pure and pristine condition. That's what we want, right? Last stanza. Adam's likeness, Lord efface. I had to look that word up as well. It means to eradicate, okay? Adam's likeness, Lord efface, stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. And it's so beautiful, right? That last stanza is my favorite. Again, this is what we desire as believers, to be conformed more and more to the image of Christ and to see Adam's likeness begin to fade away more and more in our lives, right? And Jesus is that second Adam. He is, he is the Adam that came down from above. The first Adam failed us, right? He sinned. The second Adam was successful in living a spotless life. So there's three more stanzas for you to memorize and sing on Christmas Day, right? Take a picture if you want. Okay, continuing our march through redemptive history. The next marker that we find comes nine generations after Adam in the days of Noah. Noah also is a descendant of Seth. So going back to our timeline, we see that's a pretty good date for the flood based on the, uh, uh, the genealogies in Genesis. We see the days of Noah. Genesis 6, we read that God is continually grieved right, by the wickedness of mankind on the earth. He is continually sinning, and God plans to blot man out from the face of the earth. But Genesis 6, 8 says there's one exception, and this is one of the great redemptive markers in Scripture. It says, Noah found favor in the eyes of God. He found favor. This is a redemptive phrase. Now, as I said earlier, that condition is only possible if God caused it to be so. And in fact, the language in the Hebrew confirms this. In the Hebrew, that word for favor can also be translated acceptance, even grace. Yes, grace in the Old Testament. So Noah hadn't earned God's favor. God determined to accept Noah and to use him and his family as his tool of redemption in this future post-flood world. So it's important to see this. Noah was just like us, a sinner saved by grace. He was declared to be righteous in God's sight, and because of that, he was then able to walk in fellowship with God as he carried out God's instruction in building the ark. And of course, this is followed by God then fulfilling his promise to save Noah physically, right? Save him from the great flood along with his whole family. And throughout this whole story, Genesis 7 says, the Bible says that Noah did all that God commanded him. And then much later, he's installed in the great faith chapter of Hebrews 11. Or, yeah, Hebrews 11. In fact, here's the actual verse, Hebrews 11, 7. It says, by faith, I love that, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverent fear, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So that's the New Testament commentary on, on how Noah interacted with God and what God did to make him righteous in his sight. So Noah's a very special individual, right, in the whole story of redemption. But is he sinless? No, right? In spite of the grace that God had lavished on him, three chapters later in Genesis 9, we find Noah getting drunk and shamefully passing out naked in his tent. So here's the thing. And this is typical, right, in the Bible, right? The, the Bible does not sugarcoat sin, does not draw up characters that we can't identify with. Noah's life confirms what Paul will write later in Romans 3. There is no one righteous, not even one. And that's why you and I, we can only be saved by God's extending his sovereign grace to us. The same thing was true of Noah. Now, one last note concerning the ancient saints, one more marker of redemption that most people forget to even look at. I want you to think for a second about the life of Job. Okay, go back, to our, go back to our timeline here. Now, the account of Job is very old. Most people put his life somewhere either right before the patriarchs, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, or at the very opening stage of the time of the patriarchs. And in the opening verse of the book of Job, this guy is said to be blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. That is a good reputation to have. Now, again, like Noah, that doesn't mean that Job was perfect, Right? What the Hebrew means there is that he, ha he was a man that had great integrity, that he led his family well, that they worshiped Yahweh and they shunned the evil that was going around them in the world. So it's a good report on Job, but he's not perfect. 
What I want you to point you to now is an amazing statement that Job makes in the midst of his suffering. We all know the story of Job and all that he went through, right? And then he sits down with his friends and they just, they just sort of bombard him, right? With these sort of cruel uh, inquisition type of statements that they make of their so, you know, so-called friend. But in the midst of that, in chapter 19 of Job, Job makes this amazing statement. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, he says. And at the end, he will take his stand on the earth. Now, there's some amazing things in that statement, right? First of all, look at Job's certainty. He says, I know this to be true. Something had given him that certainty. I know it. This is not a guess. This is not an empty wish. I know that my Redeemer lives. That is a statement of faith. Now, what does he mean by redeemer? Well, the Hebrew word there refers to somebody who will defend him. That's what Job needed in that moment. Someone who will avenge the wrongs done to him and acquit him of all the accusations that are now being thrown at him by his so-called friends. It fits perfectly in this moment. Job says, I have a redeemer who's alive. And Jesus certainly is. And second, he says he has faith in a redeemer who's going to come and stand up for him and plead his cause as Jesus, our advocate, does for us in the heavenly realms. And then finally, look at this verse. He says, Job believes that someday this redeemer would physically stand on the earth as Jesus certainly will 2,000 years after Job lived. So this is an amazing statement. So even before Abraham, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we see these various markers of of grace and of faith and of redemption. God is at work in people like Eve and Seth and Noah and Job. Make sense? Okay, if you're not aware of it, when you get to Genesis 12, you should know that Genesis 12 is a massive turning point in the biblical narrative, right? Right? I'm going to go through this quickly because this is, I mean, this is like a a full year sermon series, right? The life of Abraham. Here's what we know. Through Noah's son, Shem, Yahweh continues this process of redeeming his chosen line, eventually coming to this man named Abram. And to make a very long story, very short, God makes a covenant with Abraham, right? Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. uh, Mark them down if you want to read them. They're fantastic uh, passages of scripture. It's a covenant that's filled with all kinds of promises and blessings but it's an unconditional covenant, isn't it? Meaning that the covenant, the, the, the living out of this covenant is not dependent upon Abram's performance. It's completely dependent upon God's faithfulness. And the key redemption marker in this part of the narrative comes in a verse that we should all know. Genesis fifteen six. You should know that reference. You should memorize this verse. And, and I'm just going to go say, anytime that you're sharing your faith, you're, you're doing a gospel presentation, sharing your faith, Genesis 15, 6 should be a huge part of that. In that verse, God promises Abraham that he will make his descendants as numerous as, as the stars in the sky. And how does Abraham respond? He believes. It's that simple. This is, this is another marker. He takes God at his word and he believes. It's such a simple statement, but it's so powerful, right? The text says his belief, or what today we would call his faith, was credited to him, put in his account as righteousness. Notice, God gives a promise. Abram doesn't respond with any good deeds or works to that promise. Abraham simply hears God's word. He trusts in the promise, and he believes. And he's saved. In New Testament terms, we'd say Abraham was justified by faith alone, right? Which, which parallels what Paul says in Romans 3 when he says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works. And that is a common theme, right? Paul talks about it all through Galatians and all through Romans. And in both of those books, he holds up Abraham as the, the quintessential test case for proving this case that salvation has always been by God's grace. Always been by God's grace and received by faith alone. We're gonna look at Romans 4. Grab your Bibles real fast. Let's go to Romans 4, and we'll look at how Paul uses Abraham as his example. Romans 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, if you know the book of Romans, you know chapter 3 is critical, right? That's where Paul begins to lay out this case for justification by faith alone. And when he comes now to chapter 4, he's addressing his Jewish audience, his fellow Jews, who he loves so much, But he's so concerned for them because they think they can be saved. They can save themselves by adhering to the law of Moses. So Paul's going to challenge that. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say 
that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. Okay, my, our fellow ethnic Jew. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And here Paul's going to cite Genesis 15, 6. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. And, and look, we all know practically that this is true, right? When you go to work, you get paid a certain wage for the hours that you put in. And when that payroll hits at the end of the week, right, it's not a gift. You've earned it. Nobody goes to their boss and says, oh, you're so generous. You, uh, thank you for thinking of me and giving me this great gift of my paycheck. No, because we've earned it, right? It's do you because you've earned it. That's so important to understand. And that's how most people in the world approach God in religion. They say, I'll try to obey, I'll do good works, and therefore somehow I will earn God's acceptance. But of course, the gospel works on a completely different premise. Look at verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That is very different than earning it, isn't it? So the point is, if you believe you can earn God's favor then salvation is no longer a gift because you're owed it. But Paul's already just made the case in chapter 3 that not one of us can do that. Not one of us can reach to God's standard of holiness. And so when you lay your life or I lay my life side by side with the standard of God's perfect holiness, Paul says, there's not one of you righteous. He looks out at the entire world and says, God's standard, your life, none of you are righteous. Not even one of you. Not one of you even seeks after God. He says in Romans 3, there is no one who does good, he says, not even one. That's an important truth. So here's the thing. You don't want what you're owed. That will not end well for you. If you say, no, I want what's owed from God, that will not end well. You do not want the wages of your sin. That leads in eternal death. What you want is grace, and grace is only given as a gift. So you've got to decide. I'm either going to work for this, and fall woefully short, or I'm going to receive God's gift of grace. That, those are the two choices. And Paul makes this very, very clear. When you depend on your works, what you actually do is nullify God's grace. You cancel it out. Paul wrote this to the Galatian churches. He said, if righteousness came through the law or through works, if you could earn it, he says, then Christ died needlessly. Right? We don't need the cross. If you can earn it, why do, why do we need Jesus' sacrifice, he says. So we got to get this straight. It's clear that Abraham knew something about this. He knew that Yahweh would have to credit him with righteousness because he knew he was a sinner, just like us. In fact, we're shown multiple times in the Bible how sinful Abraham was, repeatedly sinned. And by the way, let's not forget what Jesus tells us about Abraham at the end of John 8. Do you remember what Jesus says at the end of John 8? He, Jesus is having this lengthy conversation with this very stubborn Jewish crowd, right? And Jesus then startles them with the statement. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad, right? And of course, we have this whole then dialogue that they go into this spiraling down and they want to stone Jesus for saying this. But this is a little bit of divine insight into this great Old Testament saint. Like Eve, like Job, it seems that Abraham was keenly aware that a future redeemer was coming who would deal with the issue of human sin. So that's just another marker on this path of redemption. Now, keep your finger there in Romans 4. Before we get to Jesus, I want to touch briefly on Moses and David. So we got Moses up on the screen now, about 1500 BC. Now Moses, who's the author of the Pentateuch, right? The first five books of the Bible. He spoke about a, a coming redeemer in all kinds of ways. Think for a second about all the foreshadowing, all the typology in all of the things that take place in the first five books of Moses that, that point to Jesus. Think about the near sacrifice of Abraham's one and only son, Isaac, right? That foreshadows Christ. Think about the Passover lamb that's slain as an atonement for sin. Think about the bread that comes down from heaven. Think about the bronze snake that's held up in the wilderness. Moses writes about all these things all of which pointed to an ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And then Jesus himself confirms later, he says to the Jews in John 5, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. 
So Moses knew this as well. Now, what is Moses most famous for? This thing we call the law, right? We call it the Mosaic Law. Established at Mount Sinai and then sort of unfolded in the first five books of the Bible. Now, the law is greatly misunderstood by Christians today. We get really confused about this. In particular, our minds tend to go straight to that sacrificial system that was established first in the tabernacle in the wilderness and then later in the temple. And so many Christians have this misconception that somehow Israelites, because it's different than the new covenant, that the Israelites were saved by somehow keeping the law and doing these animal sacrifices. And that's how they were saved. Nothing could be further from the truth. Again, Paul makes this clear in Galatians 3. Look what he writes. He says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. So if you, if you, just know, if you, if you want to try to fulfill the law and you want to rely on that, you're under a curse. Because it's written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Everything. He goes on, now it's clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So it's either keep the law perfectly, entirely, or it's going to condemn you in the end. That's the choice. That's why anybody that you know right now who is locked into a works righteousness religion, from the LDS church to Jehovah's Witnesses to the Roman Catholic Church, they are currently operating under a curse. No matter how zealous they are for their faith, they are not capable of doing enough to live up to that standard that's required to get out from under that curse. They can't do enough good things. What they need to do is quit that law and trust in God's grace alone. And so we need to keep exhorting people to do that. Here's what makes this passage you see on the screen so interesting. That last phrase, the righteous will live by faith, where does that come from? It comes from an Old Testament prophet, from Habakkuk. Paul is citing Habakkuk 2.4. Now, Habakkuk ministered to the people of Judah way back in the 7th century BC. So wait, hold on a second. Long before the first advent of Christ, Habakkuk understood this principle? Yeah, this, is, this it tells us that once again, salvation by faith alone is an Old Testament principle and that the Old Testament saints understood this. It was true in 7th century BC. It's true after the death and resurrection of Christ. Justification, salvation by faith alone. Further, it's important to know that the animal sacrifices that were taking place under the Old Covenant, they were only provisional. Don't get it mixed up here. They temporarily appeased God's wrath so that he wouldn't have to destroy his people Israel. But they were never sufficient to remove sin. And that's a really important distinction. We read about this in Hebrews 10. I'll put it on the screen. It says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things. Catch that language there. It's just a shadow. It's provisional until something greater comes. The form of things. Can never, never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Never. Can never make them perfect. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now that raises the question, if that's true, well then, back to the question, how are the Old Testament saints redeemed? Hold that thought, I'll get to it in just a second. For now, go back to Romans 4 and look at verse Actually, let's back up to verse 5. We've already read verses 1 through 5. But look who Paul brings up next in verse 6. Romans, Romans 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Quote, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So there's our man David, right? We're up to 1000 BC now. And here Paul cites David himself from Psalm 32, right? And you see there, back in 1000 BC, David too understood this principle of what it is to have your sins covered. Covered, and not by my works, but by God. How is God going to do that, right? How is he going to cover my sins? A record of sins that in the end, it says God will not take into account. But instead, God will impute the penalty of all of your sins and take it upon himself. That's the implication here. Did David know that a redeemer would have to come to accomplish this? Absolutely. 
In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see God make another covenant, right? This time with David. And he promises to raise up a descendant of David after him, a king, he says, who will sit on an eternal throne. Who can sit on an eternal throne? Only an eternal king. That's the implication there. So there's no doubt in my mind that David understood that it was through his line that one day this promised Messiah and this Redeemer would come to save his people from their sins. Okay, last one on this timeline. We're filling it in. Let's look at the Old Testament prophets that go from about 900 to 430 BC. What did the prophets know about this Redeemer? What did they know about God's plan and the first advent of Christ? The answer is a lot, a lot. It was the prophets who consistently spoke of a savior and the need to redeem Israel. Over and over again, they spoke about God's kingdom and his power and his justice and his righteousness. And they spoke of a suffering servant, especially Isaiah, right? And interestingly, God shed some light on the mindset of the Old Testament prophets in the New Testament through the apostle Peter. Here's what, here's what he wrote in 1 Peter 1. Again, God's inspired word looking back at the Old Testament to explain what's going on behind the scenes. Peter writes, as to this salvation, the prophets, listen, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, church. They prophesied of the grace that would come to New Testament believers. They made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Things, he says, into which angels long to look into. That, that is an amazing statement, isn't it? Catch that. The insight that God gave to his chosen prophets led them to search for details about a future era of God's grace being poured out. They knew it in their soul. They knew it through communication with Yahweh. They understood that something greater was coming, that God's grace would be poured out in a new measure. In fact, Peter says it was the spirit of Christ within them that was sort of burning that desire within them. And some men, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they're given sizable chunks of information, not just about the identity of Christ, but about the details of this new covenant that God is going to establish with Israel and Judah. And then just to add to the mystery, you have these morsels of information that these men knew about in the Old Testament, about God's grace, and they were so excited, so much so that the angels were like, wait, what's happening over there? Like the, the picture is they strained their necks to see what's going on. Now, why would they do that? Because angels are relative outsiders to this drama unfolding on the earth. But what they long to do is to see Yahweh work amongst his people and to see God pour out this plan that they couldn't even have fathomed, but now they're starting to see it and they long to know the details. That's the story of the Old Testament. By the way, if the angels got excited about that, how can we take it for granted? If the angels got excited about this plan, we every day should be thinking about how exciting it is that our God has redeemed us. All right, one last look at our timeline just so you can get the full picture. Again, where are we? Between first and second advent of Christ, right? This could come to an end very, very soon. Okay, <laughs> just check it. All right, so now we come to the very heart of redemption, the very locus of redemption, the first advent of Christ. And for that, we're going to go back to this morning's uh, Advent song and look at some more lyrics. Let's look at the lyrics that we've already sung this morning and we know really well. How does this song begin? I'm not going to sing it, so it, that would be a disaster. Gabe, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, first of all, what does hark mean? Okay, good. Listen or hear. Okay, good. So some of you guys knew that. <laughs> what, what is a herald angel? An announcing, a proclaiming angel, an announcing angel. Have you ever been to, to England and the, the herald walks in with the bell at the end of the day and he, he proclaims all the news of the day? I'm dating myself, <laughs> I'm sure. But that's, that's a herald, someone who proclaims the news of the day. Okay, so, so the song line... Hark the herald angels sing is, is basically this. Listen to what the angels proclaim as they sing. And what is it they sing? Glory to the newborn king. Listen to them say it. Glo and imagine the heavenly host, right? Glory to the newborn king. Then he goes on. Peace on earth and mercy mild. That whole picture that Wesley's writing about comes straight out of the Christmas story in Luke 2. L let me read just a, two verses. 
And you got these shepherds right on the hills. And it says, and suddenly there appeared before them the angel of, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And what Charles Wesley did then is he's, he was in the text there in those lines and then he sort of went out and did some interpretive work. But it's such an important statement. He interpreted this as God and sinners reconciled. And is that not the Christmas story in a nutshell? That Christ came to reconcile sinners? I love what Wesley did with that. God made a way when there was no way, right? It's impossible to know God. It's impossible to earn our way to God, but God made a way to reconcile us to him. Wow. Then in the next line of the, long line of the song, Wesley invites us to join into this moment. I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, try to picture that heavenly host. I mean, now some of you... When we go to Israel next year, we'll go out on some of the hillsides near Bethlehem and we'll see sheep. They still have shepherds and sheep out there. We'll, we'll sit on the hillsides of Bethlehem and you can picture it, right? But picture the sky being filled with this heavenly host. And so Wesley invites us in. He says, joyful, all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. Join in this song. Glory to God in the highest. Join. It's a song of victory. So as believers, we shout hallelujah. We shout glory to God in the highest. And with the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem, right? In the fullness of the times, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Wow. Now, listen to some of the theology in stanzas two and three. I'll put them up here. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. That doesn't rhyme, does it? Does that bug anybody? I mean, I love the theology, it just doesn't rhyme. Okay, <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> the, the least musical person in this room. <laughs> Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. So there you see, first of all, the essential truth of the virgin birth. And that is an essential truth, right? And you see there are multiple truths right out of John 1. We have the second person of the Godhead, now veiled and taking on human flesh and making his dwelling among mankind. And then you have the incarnate deity and Emmanuel, right? God with us, so, so cool. Last stanza. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that we no more may die. Born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. So now Wesley brings in prophets, right? The Prince of Peace, which prophet used that phrase? Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6. Son of Righteousness comes out of Malachi 4, where Malachi is talking about the day of the Lord. And you see in that third line, this reference to the humility of Christ, right? Imagine the most glorious king the world will ever see born in an animal's feeding trough. So it says, mild he lays his glory by. So beautiful, right? But born for three great purposes. Look at the word. Three times it says born. Three great purposes. To deliver us from eternal death, to raise us up into heaven, and to produce in us the new birth. The second birth, the, the new birth of salvation. So look, beautiful song. But, but even more so, what a glorious announcement we have in the Christmas story in Luke 2, right? What an amazing scene. And the name of Jesus says it all. Yeshua, right? What does it mean in Hebrew? God saves. God saves. Yeshua, right? As the angel told Joseph, you shall name him Yeshua, or in Greek, Jesus, for he will save his, sin, save his people from their sins. He's the fulfillment of Israel's messianic hope. He's the hope of the entire world, even for Gentiles like us, who've now been grafted into the tree of Israel, who've been brought near to God, reckoned as sons of Abraham now by faith. He is the fulfillment of all of that. In the incarnate Son of God, redemption has arrived. And not just redemption, this is important, but also propitiation for sin. Propitiation for sin. That's what the Old Testament saints didn't have. They had a covering for sin, but not propitiation. Listen to this key verse from Romans 3. This explains how the Old Testament saints eventually are ransomed. Verse 23, we know this verse, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a what? As a gift, not works, as a gift by his grace 
through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through what? Faith. Key phrase now. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance or in his restraint, he passed over the sins previously committed. Okay, what does this tell us? It's speaking of the period prior to the cross. It's referring to the sins of all those who lived before the new covenant age came. It says, in his restraint, God passed over the sins of the Old Testament saints. And in order to demonstrate to the world that he was still righteous and just, right? He had passed over those sins, but God forbid he ever be seen as anything but fully righteous and fully just. So what did he do? He publicly caused his one and only son to be nailed to a cross for the world to see so that he would bleed and die. Think about that for a second. He publicly did that so that the world would see God is righteous and God is just in that. What he did was he postponed the payment and the full penalty for the sins of the Old Testament saints until, until an acceptable sacrifice would come. And it couldn't be any other way because there, there was no sacrifice other than Christ that would be sufficient to ransom the sins of the Old Testament saints. Make sense? So in my mind, the best way to understand what Paul's saying here is this. Those under the old covenant who believed God in their day had their sins covered by a future promissory note. Okay, the ones who believed in God, the ones who were saved in the old covenant, right? They were covered by a future promissory note. And when Christ came, that note became due. And the payment was made on the cross. The Father so sovereignly ordained that it should happen that way. And that's what we mean when we talk about Jesus bearing the weight of all sin, past, present, and future. That's what we're talking about. Only God the Son could bear that weight. Are we grateful at Christmas for that? That he did that? Now, last thing. When we say your king is coming to redeem a people, that also means the future. The, the, the not yet portion, right? And this is the exciting part. Listen to, this, listen to this glorious truth from Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, beginning of verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having etern obtained what? Listen, to, look at that phrase, eternal redemption. He obtained eternal redemption. That is amazing imagery that we're given here to contemplate. What the author of Hebrews is doing is painting two simultaneous pictures for us. One is the tabernacle that we know is on the earth. It's made by human hands, right? It's got a human high priest in it. Goats and calves are sacrificed there. But we're told in scripture that that tabernacle on the earth, that human tabernacle, was only a shadow or a copy of something very real up in the heavenly realms. That's important to understand. There's a real and glorious tabernacle in the heavenly realms, not made by human hands. And Jesus, our Redeemer and High Priest, entered into that perfect tabernacle and he brought his own blood and presented it as a sacrifice before the Father. And notice he did it one time for all. What a picture we have here. The result is eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. And for all those who are found in him, who are covered by that blood sacrifice, we too have eternal redemption in Christ. Already we have it, but not yet. Someday, someday, right? So what does that full eternal redemption actually look like someday? Here's the not yet part. Let me just share a few thoughts. The Bible envisions a day when God's people will inherit a whole new creation, a whole new physical heavens and earth. The streets are gonna be filled with people like us, former captives who through no merit of their own live together for all eternity who are redeemed, forgiven, and free forever. Once spiritually dead, once slaves to sin, once condemned to eternal separation from God, but because Jesus paid the price to redeem us, we're rescued from the eternal consequences of every single sin we've ever committed. Forever. This is, this is the not yet of redemption that we get to look forward to. So it's no wonder that in Revelation 5 it says we're going to sing a new song when we get there. A song of praise to the Lamb of God who was slain. A song of praise to the Lamb who purchased a people for himself. And there'll be no more pain and no more hurt. Every tear will have been eternally wiped away. Any broken relationship completely repaired. 
No longer will we suffer in sinful flesh. There'll be no desire for sin at all. Sickness and death overcome. They'll never again haunt us or worry us. And best of all, we will live in the presence of God. He will be our God with us. Emmanuel, forever. And nothing unclean will be allowed to enter into this new creation. Pure worship will characterize the family of God in a world without end, and we will be fit with brand new glorified bodies for all eternity. Are we grateful? Man, that is, I mean, redemption is amazing enough. Genesis 3 all the way up until today. It is amazing in the already, but the not yet. Wow, wow. So Merry Christmas, friends right? What a story we have from Genesis to Revelation. So my last thing is, do not let Christmas slip by without considering all these things, without remembering the two things we've already talked about in this series. Number one, that God is revealing himself. And number two, he's redeeming a people for himself. Make sure that you don't forget it. Make sure that in your home, you're teaching it to your kids, that you're preaching the gospel to yourselves. Remember that he has sovereignly purposed to redeem you and to make you his own, and at a very high price. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are um, we're overwhelmed by your story. It's, it's even so much bigger than we can cover in, in 45 minutes, Lord. From Genesis to Revelation, this is the story of your great love for your people. And the fact that you've not only revealed yourself, but you are, you are calling this people together and that you are purchasing us back, a people for yourself, a people that you are pleased with, a people that bring you glory. Lord, we want to be more like that every day, conformed to the image of Christ, putting behind us the image of the first Adam. Lord, continue to sanctify us, sanctify this church family. But Lord, more than anything today in this Christmas season, just make us a grateful people for all that you have done for us. And Lord, even in just a few moments as the ushers come forward, we have a chance to to worship with our lips as we sing and also with our giving, Lord. Because you have given us so much, we want to give back to you. So Father, bless every dollar that's given. Lord, most of all, just be pleased with the songs that come from our heart. May they be true, may they be real from our hearts this morning as we praise your amazing name. You are the Lamb of God who was slain, the Lamb of God who has purchased us for your glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you now. Amen.